Yeah. Now, as gunshots echo across the windswept, snow-covered reaches of the wild northwest, Quaker popped wheat yeah. and Quaker popped rice, yeah. the breakfast cereal shot from gun, yeah. Yeah. present the challenge of the Yukon. <laughs> It's Yukon King, swiftest and strongest lead dog of the Northwest, blazing the trail for Sergeant Preston of the Northwest Mounted Police in his relentless pursuit of lawbreakers. One king, one husky. Gold, gold discovered in the Yukon, a stampede to the Klondike in the wild race for riches, back to the days of the gold rush. With Quaker Puff Wheat and Quaker Puff Rice, bringing you the adventures of Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog Yukon King as they meet... The Challenge of the Yukon. Here's the breakfast I really go for. He's enjoying his Quaker puffed wheat. Looks good, too. It is good. Right, Billy. And so is Quaker puffed rice. These giant ready-to-serve grains of wheat or rice are premium grains. They're shot from guns, puffed to perfection. Exploded up to eight times normal size to make them crisp and tender. Quaker puffed wheat or Quaker puffed rice shot from guns is good for you, too. Makes a thrifty deluxe family breakfast with milk and fruit. Tomorrow, sure, try this breakfast treat. Quaker puffed rice or Quaker puffed wheat. Stella Adams was one of the first women to reach the Yukon soon after the electrifying cry of gold rang round the world. At first she seemed to drift from camp to camp, as if looking for something she never found. Finally she settled down to the business of panning the creeks, and luck was with her from that day on. Five years later, Stella Adams was settled comfortably in a cozy log cottage near Selkirk. And though she apparently had everything she wanted... She knew that gold could not buy that which counted most. Then one day an idea came to her and she sent for Sergeant Preston. Sergeant, I've come to the conclusion that money doesn't buy everything. Happiness, for instance. A lot of people find that out, Stella. I've got more money than I'll ever need and there's plenty of folks who'd like to help me spend it. But they're the wrong kind. I can understand that. I'd like to spend my money where to do the most good for the most people. Now, you've been all over the Yukon. I thought maybe you could tell me how to spend it or who I could give it to. Stella, ever heard of Father John? The Good Samaritan of the Trail? Yes. Who up here hasn't? Why, I recollect the time my dogs got the distemper and died. I was 200 miles from nowhere and it was 60 below. My supplies were nearly gone, too. I headed for Dawson afoot. And, well... I guess you know the rest of the story. You'll nearly starve to death until you reached one of Father John's food caches along the trail. That's exactly what happened. And you ask me if I ever heard of Father John. He's been a godsend to lost miners and travelers. No accounting for the number of lives that Father John has saved with his food caches. I've often wondered where he got his money to carry on his work. It takes a lot of it, I reckon, to do all he does. Takes plenty. He's never asked for a cent from anyone. Then where does he get it? Pans it from the creeks himself, then turns around and buys food for his caches. But Father John's getting old, Stella, and panning his own money's hard for him. Sergeant, he could use my money, couldn't he? I was going to suggest that, Stella. When'll you see him again, Sergeant? King and I are on our way now to Lone Elk Station, the fur company's outpost. I believe he lives somewhere up that way. About ten miles from the post. I have a report that two men who robbed the mail sled last month have holed up for the winter at Lone Elk Station. You're going up to get them? Yes, and when that's done, King and I will have time to drop by Father John's cabin. Then tell him he can quit panning his own gold. From now on, I'll see that he has all he needs. You're very generous, Stella. I know you'll make Father John mighty happy. How about it, King? <laughs> <laughs> Father John and King are the best of friends. You see... We've run out of food a couple of times and had to tap on the Father John's caches. Oh. There's always a few bones for dogs. Well, if King thinks Father John is a good man, I guess I can't go wrong in grub staking him. <laughs> See? He agrees with you, Stella. Now we'll be getting on. I'm in a hurry to reach Lone Elk Station. A week later, Sergeant Preston and King trudged over the trail to Lone Elk Station. 
And as they got near to the fur post, the Mountie saw the dog quicken his pace and become more and more alert to his surroundings. Up ahead was a giant fir tree, blazed on its trunk by a woodman's axe. And when King saw it, he began to bark. Oh, fellow, what's all the excitement? For a few moments, Sergeant Preston was puzzled by the dog's actions. As they reached the tree, King dashed off to the left, ran a few yards, then stopped and barked again. Hey, boy, you're going the wrong way. We go straight ahead. Oh, I get it now, fella. This blazed tree marks the division of the trail. Sure, that's it. That fork leads to Father John's cabin. You want to go see Father John? All right, King, we'll go see him, boy. And tomorrow we'll go on to Lone Elk Station. An hour later, Sergeant Preston and King approached the lonely cabin in which the man known as Father John, the Samaritan of the Trail, lived alone with his own sled dogs. The good man saw them in the distance and was standing in the doorway when the Mountie and his dog came up. King bounded ahead of Sergeant Preston to greet Father John. Well, as I live and breathe, it's Sergeant Preston and King. <laughs> oh, King, fellow, you're a sight for my poor aging eyes. Yes, sir. Hello, Father John. Well, come in, Sergeant. You're just in time for a pot of tea. Yes, King, and I have a juicy bone on the stew pot. You, you just come right inside with Sergeant Preston. King, you old rascal, I'll bet you were thinking of that bone when you made me turn off the trail. <laughs> How have you been, Father John? Oh, I guess I'm getting old, Sergeant. My joints ache me terrible of late. That's too bad. You're looking well. And now you sit down here by the fire, and I'll get King's bone out of the stew and let it cool. Thanks. <laughs> down, King. Here it is, King. There you are. It'll be cool by the time I get the tea fixed. And while I'm fixing it, Sergeant, you can tell me what brings you and King to my cabin at this time of the winter. There's a woman in Selkirk who asked me to stop by and see you, Father John. A woman? Yes, she wants to do something for you. You saved her life once. While the tea oh, simmered on the help. coals, Father John listened in silence as Sergeant Preston told him about Stella Adams' offer of aid. As the sergeant talked, he saw tears come to the old man's eyes. And when he finished the story... Father John dropped his head into his arms and began to sob. Sergeant, it is said that bread cast upon the waters returns tenfold someday. But this is bitter bread that has returned me. Bitter? Oh, I don't understand, Father John. I thought Stella's offer would make you happy. Had it? Had the offer come from anyone else in the world, it would have made me happy. But coming from her... You know Stella Adams? Yes. But she doesn't know me. Nobody in the Yukon knows me. That's why I'm here. I should have known that someday my past would catch up with me. But to, to have her offer me help, I, it's too much. Father John, I'm not interested in your past, and neither is Stella Adams. We both want to help them. But I could never accept her offer, Sergeant. And if I refuse, she'd find out why I did. I'm an old man now, Sergeant. I, I can't keep my secret any longer. Well, very well. Tell me if you wish. Why can't you accept aid from Stella Adams? Because... Uh, because I killed her father. You, a murderer? That's impossible, Father John. You must be ill. No, Sergeant, I'm not ill. I killed him. And I've spent the rest of my life trying to make amends for what I've done. Quite sorry, Father John. No, I'm just plain John Taggart. The murderer. And I... I want to give myself up. Where did you commit this crime? In Mackenzie Territory, before I came to the Yukon. On your own admission, I'll have to take you to headquarters. There you can make a statement, sign a confession. Very well. But uh, I want to round up my dogs. I can't leave them here, you know. I'll see they're taken care of. There, there are a few other things I want to do. I'd, I'd like a little time before I leave here. Very well. Also, I'd like to dispose of the food I have here in the cabin. We'll load it on the sled and cache it along the trail, as you've always done. King and I have to go into Lone Elk Station. We'll stop here for you on the way back. You mean, now that you know, you'll trust me to stay here while you're gone? A man like you can't run 
from his conscience. Yes, I see what you mean. I'll be ready and waiting when you and King get back here. We uh, may not be traveling alone on the way back. We won't. Who else will be going with us? Two criminals I came up here to arrest. I see. Well, I'll get you a tea, Sergeant. The isolated outpost of Lone Elk Station was less than ten miles from John Taggart's cabin. But the lights of the small community were blinking in the Arctic twilight by the time Sergeant Preston and King strode down the deserted main street toward the post factor's cabin. A man with furtive eyes watched them from the window of the tavern until they had passed the door. Then he turned and called. Hey, Joe, come here. Yeah, what do you want, Studs? Take a look down the street there. You see that critter and the dog? Yeah, what about it? It means we got to clear out of here and fast. Clear out? I don't get you, Studs. You fool, that's Sergeant Preston and his dog, King. Are you sure? Of course I'm sure. I was standing right here at the window when they walked past. You certain he didn't see you? If he had, he wouldn't have passed the door. You can bet on that. Now, come on, let's ease out of here so nobody gets suspicious. And we'll head for high timber. Just a minute, Studs. Haven't you got any sense? What? We'd have a team of dogs if you hadn't lost them in a card game with that prospector. I warned you not to bail. Oh, quit crying over spilled milk, will you? I'm telling you, Stud, just 30 below outside. Without grub and plenty of it and dogs to haul it, we won't have a chance with that Mountie on our trail. Yeah, what do you want to do? Just stay here till he comes in and arrest us? No, no, of course not. Hey, I've got an idea. Uh, let's hear it and make it fast. Ever hear of an old geezer they call Father John? Yeah. Uh, you mean the guy that spends his time leaving grub on the trail for lost trappers and miners? Yeah, yeah, that's the one. I heard some fellas talking about him today. They said he's got a cabin about ten miles east of here, and he's got plenty of grub there. Hey, you got something there, Joe. <laughs> plenty of grub and a good team of huskies. I get you, Joe. Now, come on, let's sneak out here while we've got the chance. With luck, we should have a couple hours head start on Preston. And with the wind blowing like it is, our trail will be covered so he can't follow us. Now, come on, let's get going. We'll continue our story in just a moment. Say, tell me, what do you think of right off when you hear these three famous words? Shot from gun. Gee, that's easy. You'll think of Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice. Because they're shot from guns, that's why. Ah, right, Billy. Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice actually are shot from guns. Is that what makes them bigger and better tasting? Right you are, Billy. These giant ready-to-serve breakfast grains are exploded up, up, up to eight times normal size. That's what makes Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice crisp and tender as nuts in November. Golly, they're sure good with milk and fruit. More important, long hours at school and play call for a hearty breakfast. And Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice furnish added food values of restored natural grain amounts of vitamin B1, niacin, and iron. So how about it? You'll be getting off to a flying start when you eat Quaker puffed rice or Quaker puffed wheat. To get the original crisp, fresh wheat or rice shot from guns, always buy the famous big Quaker red and blue package. It's never sold in bags or bulk. And now to continue our story. Sergeant Preston didn't know that Joe and Studs were prepared to leave Lone Elk and escape capture. The Mountie made his way to the factor's cabin where he and King were given a hearty greeting by Pierre, the fur company representative. Pierre insisted they partake of a good warm meal before setting forth again. These men, Joe and Studs, they cannot leave the village, my friend. You have plenty of time to eat big meal. What makes you so certain of that, Pierre? <laughs> because I, Pierre, played a big trick on them. You played a trick on them? You see, it is this way. When they come to Lone Elk Station... I think maybe they're the ones who robbed the mail sled. I send you the message to come quick, take look, to make sure. Yes, I got your message. That's why I'm here. Then I think maybe they leave before you get here. I say, Pierre, you got to keep them here. So I send for my friend Pharaoh Lacrosse. He used to be a gambler, didn't he? We oui. and my friend Pharaoh, he become gambler again. Only these men, Joe and Studs, they think him prospector. 
You mean Farrell Lacrosse got them into a game? Sure he do that. <laughs> he, he win their money. <laughs> he win their dog team. You're pretty sharp, Pierre. <laughs> I've got to hand it to you. We cannot leave Lone Elk Station. Oh, oh, they got to stay here now until you come. Now you got here, no need for a big rush. You got plenty of time to eat big dinner. <laughs> uh, uh, say, my friend, tell me something. What is it, Pierre? When you come in my place, you have long face. Maybe like you very unhappy, huh? Well, frankly, Pierre, I was very unhappy when I walked in here. I still am. Uh, you tell Pierre what make you unhappy, huh? No, if I told you, Pierre, you'd be unhappy too. Huh? Huh? Oh, oh oui. Well, just as you say. <laughs> now I go fix bear steaks. <laughs> The hearty meal finished, Sergeant Preston and King, guided by Pierre, made a tour of the outpost in search of Joe Stanley and Studs Ross. But it soon became evident they had fled. Pierre was heartbroken. Oh, I am the big fool. I should be arrested, put in prison. Don't feel badly about it, Pierre. You uh, thought you'd marooned them here. But those two crooks are clever. And I am the big fool. I make fool of my good friend, Sergeant Preston. I should be arrested. Don't worry about me, Pierre. Don't worry too much about Joe and Studs. No? Why not? Must be 30 below now. We know they have no supplies and no dogs. They can't get far. If they should return, I authorize you to arrest them and hold them prisoners till I get back. We, oui. we. Oui, but where do you go, my friend? To the cabin of Father John. Ah, oh, we. Oui. My good friend, Father John. Tell him when you see him that Pierre love him like the brother. I will, Pierre. Now King and I will push on. Good night, my friend. Good night, Pierre. All right, King. Come on, boy. The dull light of the short day was just beginning when Joe Stanley and Studs Ross broke trail through the drifted snow within sight of the lonely cabin of the man known as Father John, the Good Samaritan of the trail. A thin thread of smoke rose upward from the chimney and curled fitfully in the gusty wind. The old geezer must be up and about. He's got a good fire going inside. Yeah, I just noticed. Take a look at that sled in front of the cabin. It's loaded down. Studs, looks like we got here just in time. I reckon he'd be heading out on the trail soon. No doubt of it. Guess he's fixing to go plant some more of them food caches along the trails. <laughs> well, he's got a surprise coming. Yeah, he sure has. Now look out for his dogs, Joe. They might be mean. But the dogs, already hitched to the traces, paid little attention to the new arrivals, remaining curled up in the snow, their bushy tails over their noses. Joe Stanley knocked on the door. Come in, Sergeant. What did he say? I didn't get it. I just said, come in. Now, go on, Joe, open the door. I've been waiting for you, Sergeant, and let it go. Uh, who do you think you're talking to? Uh, who are you? And not who you thought. I was sitting here by the fire. I didn't look up. Who was you expecting? Expecting? Why, Sergeant Preston, the out here. I was leaving with him. Oh, you were, huh? What, <clears throat> what can I do for you men? Well, my friend here, he, he slipped on the ice back there huh? in the creek. We think his arm's busted at the wrist. Oh, no, that's too oh. bad. Eh? Oh, yeah, it's, it's hurting plenty. Oh. Let me see it. You'd better bend down here by the light of the fire. My eyes aren't what they used to be. Like this, huh? No, show me. Oh. Oh. <laughs> yeah, that takes care of him, studs. Just like we planned yeah, I it. sure let him have it with the butt of this gun. That finished him all right. What a break we got. I figured we'd have to take an hour catching his dogs and packing a sled. Yeah, he took care of all that for us. Luck's sure playing in our hands, Joe. Hey, look around here. Uh huh. Looks like he was fixing to leave for quite a spell, don't it? Sure does. He's cleaned the cabin out. Well, he was getting old. Maybe he was going down to Selkirk with a Monty. Hey. What's the matter? Maybe he wasn't looking for us at all. Maybe he came up here to get the old man. Yeah, could be. Well, let's not take any chances. What do we do? We got to get the old man's body out of sight. But before we do, I'll write a note. Give me that piece of paper laying on the floor. Huh? Oh, yeah. Hey, here you are. You got a pencil? Yeah. yeah. Sergeant Preston. I've changed my mind. I'm not going with you. 
How's that? Yeah, that's fine, Joe. Yeah, I'll just sign it, Father John. Leave it on the table where the money will find it when he comes in. Now let's get the old fellow out of sight, Joe. Meanwhile, Sergeant Preston and the great dog King pressed toward the lonely cabin of the Samaritan of the trail. When Father John's cabin came into view, it seemed to be enveloped by a strange silence. No smoke curled from the chimney, and there was no sign of life about. When there was no response to a knock on the door, Sergeant Preston lifted the latch and walked into the cabin. Empty. Oh, it says... Sergeant Preston, I have changed my mind. I'm not going with you, Father John. So that's it. He changed his mind. King, I never have believed it of him. Sergeant Preston sagged into a chair and looked again at the note he'd found on the table. He read it again and again, oblivious to King, who was now moving about the room, his sensitive nose telling him that the man known as Father John had had visitors since he and Sergeant Preston were there. Finally, the sergeant looked up from the piece of paper. And to think he'd sign it, Father John, after what he told me. But don't be mad at him, fella. He's an old man. He doesn't realize he can't escape. <laughs> Can't have much of a start on us. The trail of his dog team can still be seen. Come on, boy, let's hit the trail. I've got to go after John Taggart. What's the matter, boy? Something under that floorboard you want? We can't waste time, fella. Come on. Sergeant Preston started for the door of the cabin, but the dog refused to obey his command to follow. Instead, he clawed at the floorboard furiously, growling as he did. Sergeant Preston paused at the door of the cabin and noted its cleanliness and order. Perturbed by the ordeal ahead of him, the sergeant spoke with unusual sharpness. Stop that foolishness, King. We've got work to do, and we've got to do it now. The old man cleaned up his cabin before he left. He swept his trash under the floor, and that included your bone. I'm ashamed of you, King. Now, come on. We got the bone. Let's go. As the sergeant moved to the outdoors, King turned and followed, his head and bushy tail lowered in a great disappointment. For once, he could not understand his master. And instead of bounding ahead on the clear trail of the sled runners, he followed sullenly behind as Preston trudged through the snow. For three hours, they followed the trail of the sled at one pair of human footprints. And then, as they topped a ridge, Sergeant Preston halted abruptly. What? Field King. The great dog obeyed the command automatically, drawing up beside the sergeant. And then in the valley below them, he saw a sled. One man walked beside it while the other rode the runners. Two men, but only one set of tracks. Now I understand. No wonder I thought it was Father John we were trailing. King, old boy, I apologize. I should have lifted that floorboard. We'll go back there again after we've arrested these two. Come on, boy. Sergeant Preston and King broke into a trot, running parallel to the path of Joe and Studs, and separated from the outlaws by a ridge. In a few moments, they were ahead. They kept going until they reached the edge of a draw where the Mountie drew up. King, standing at his master's side, knew that a clash with the enemy was impending, and his ears pointed alertly in anticipation. Yeah, well ahead of them, King. There they come, boy. Get ready for them. Let's go, King. Suddenly, Sergeant Preston stepped into the draw in full sight of the two men with the sled. King bounded ahead of him, his fur bristling in excitement. Halt in the name of the Queen! Hey. Amani, get him, Joe! Take him, King! Shoot him! No, you don't drop that gun! Oh! Get him off! Just dog him! Hold him, King! Hold him! We quit! We quit, Amani! That's better. Get this dog away! Keep your hands up and he'll not bother you. I'll take your gun. There. So you're Joe Stanley and Studs Ross. Yeah. I guess ain't no sense in us tonight. That's who we are, all right, Amani. In the name of the Queen, I arrest you both for murder. What? Murder? You mean mail robbery? I mean murder. The murder of Father John. You... You found the body. My dog King found him under the floorboards of his cabin. The dog found him. I knew we should have brought the body along with us on the sled and stuffed him under the ice somewhere. And even your dog had never have found him. You're like every other criminal, studs. They never see their mistake until it's too late, uh... and that one mistake always traps them. Come on, you're headed for Selkirk in jail. Watch him, King. A week later, Sergeant Preston sat in the comfortable living room of Stella Adams' cottage in Selkirk. He told her how King had discovered the body of Father John, and how, a short time later, Joe Stanley and Studs Ross had been arrested on the trail. And then he said, 
The death of Father John's a great loss to all of us, Stella. There'll be no one to carry on the great work he started. Oh, that's where you're wrong, Sergeant. While you've been telling me about it, I came to a conclusion of my own. I'll take over where he left off. But you're a woman, Stella. It was a hard and dangerous life that Father John lived. Yes, I know it was. But he must have been happy in doing it, Sergeant. And that's what I want. Happiness. I'm sure you'll find it, Stella. But, uh... Let me ask you something. Why haven't you been happy? Because of a promise I made to my dying father. A promise I've never been able to fulfill. To your father? Yes, Sergeant. You see, my father was shot in a fight with another man in Mackenzie territory. The man who shot him fled and was never heard from again. Yes, go on. The man thought he'd killed my father, but father lived for two years and took all the blame for what happened. Just before he died, he asked me to find the man who shot him. Find him and clear him before the law. I've tried to find him, Sergeant, but I failed. What was the man's name? John Taggart. But you wouldn't know him, Sergeant. He wouldn't have used that name. You're right about that. And as far as I know, he may be dead. Stella, John Taggart is dead. You you know that to be a fact? Yes, and I'm sure that... Wherever he is, he knows you intend to carry on the work of Father John, and he's happy. You see, John Taggart became Father John. Father John? John Taggart? The case of John Taggart is closed. (laughs) Yes, King, the case is closed. In just a moment, Sergeant Preston will give you a preview of Wednesday's program. Be careful. Accidents can happen. Yes, fellas and girls, accidents do happen. Every few seconds, there's an accident and someone's hurt. Don't let it happen to you. Be careful. Most accidents are due to just plain carelessness. So use your old bean when you're playing out of doors. Be careful when you cross the street. Stop and look. Never cross when the traffic light is red. Be careful riding your bikes. Never hitch rides on the back of trucks or ride in the dark without lights. Be careful not to dash out into the street after a football. If you do, you're not being very smart. Don't ever take a chance. Not even a little chance. Be careful. The life you save may be your own. These radio dramas, a feature of the challenge of the Yukon Incorporated, are created and produced by George W. Trendle, directed by Fred Flowerday, and supervised by Charles D. Livingston. The part of Sergeant Preston is played by Paul Sutton. They are brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at the same time by Quaker Puffed Wheat and Quaker Puffed Rice, a breakfast cereal shot from gun. Listen Wednesday when Sergeant Preston and Yukon King meet the challenge of the Yukon in the adventure of Preston Turns the Tables. King and I had been traveling south through one of the worst rainstorms we'd ever seen. It was the middle of the night when we reached a small shack on Rock Mountain. We went inside and went to sleep. Daybreak brought an earth-shaking blast that started a landslide. The flimsy cabin collapsed on top of us, and the exciting events that followed make a thrilling story. Be sure to hear this exciting story Wednesday. Till then, this is J. Michael wishing you goodbye, good luck, and good health from Quaker Puffed Wheat and Quaker Puffed Rice. So long. For a delicious hot breakfast, eat Quaker Oats. The giant of the cereals is Quaker Oats. Yes, the giant of the cereals is Quaker Oats. Delicious, nutritious, makes you feel ambitious. The giant of the cereals is Quaker Oats. Say, boys and girls, do you want to be a star someday in sports and activities? Then start on good Quaker Oats breakfast tomorrow. Because nourishing oatmeal gives you more growth and endurance than any other whole grain cereal. Still less than one penny a serving. Quaker and Mother's Oats are the same.